Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be introducing you guys to the next major topic uh, that we're gonna be discussing pretty much from here up until the end of our semester. Um, we're gonna be introducing you guys to the concept of a hypothesis test. And we're gonna learn a whole variety of hypothesis tests over the next few weeks. But in today's lecture, what we're really going to do is sort of lay down the structure of hypothesis testing. Because as we'll see, even though we'll learn how to do this in many different situations with many different types of data sets and all that, the structure itself will always remain the same. So the idea in this video is that we're gonna go ahead, introduce you guys to that structure, and then look at sort of a real life example of how that structure is applied so that you guys can get a sense of really what we're gonna be doing for the next few weeks. Then in later videos, you'll actually see how we do the mathematics behind these tests, but you'll already understand the structure that these tests live in. So this is gonna be your introduction to hypothesis testing. So. A hypothesis testing in general is a statistical procedure used to determine if a data set provides evidence for a claim. So when you think about hypothesis testing, it's really a form of inferential statistics because its whole purpose is to basically allow you to determine if the data that you have in front of you, a sample of data, provides evidence for some sort of claim. Now we'll see a whole variety of data sets from quantitative data sets to categorical data sets. Sometimes we'll have one, two, or even more than two samples, but it'll always be about using that data to decide if we have evidence for a particular claim. All right, hypothesis tests in general always consist of five main steps. So we're gonna go over what those five steps look like. This also is just a reminder, the reason the word sort of five is you know in all caps here, is that anytime we're doing a hypothesis test, it's gonna be important to know those five steps because no matter what form of hypothesis test we're doing, these five steps always remain the same. Okay, so step one. As its name would imply, the first step of a hypothesis test is setting up the hypotheses. Every hypothesis test will always have two distinct hypotheses. These two distinct hypotheses are named the null hypothesis, which in notation is H sub zero, and the alternate hypothesis, which in notation is H sub A. So what is the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis is our baseline assumption. It's what we're going to assume is true throughout the statistical test for computational purposes. So in other words, the, the null hypothesis is something that from the start we're going to assume is true. So the null hypothesis usually comes from previous research. So somebody has previously found that this is something that we should believe, or it's a commonly accepted value or belief. So the null hypothesis is sort of your framework that you're going to use. It's your baseline assumption. The alternate hypothesis, on the other hand, is our actual sort of fancy name for our claim. So whatever we're trying to find evidence for, that is what we will make our alternate hypothesis. So in other words, the two hypotheses, the null is what we assume will be true for computational purposes, and the alternate is the thing that is our claim, the thing we're looking for evidence for. Okay, the second step of every hypothesis test is a set of statistical conditions. So each hypothesis test will come with their own set of statistical conditions that must be true for the results of the test to be valid. What that means is if those conditions aren't met, it doesn't matter computationally what the test says, the result of the test, those results just simply are not valid. So every time we do a hypothesis test, test, there will always be a moment where we have to check these conditions to know that the results of our test are valid. These conditions are going to be different for every test, but one of them that will always be included is that the data we are using is quote unquote good data. And if you guys remember from the very beginning of our course, good data means random and representative data. Now, there will be other conditions as well, but one of the ones that will always be there is this random and representative. And then there'll be some other ones that we need to confirm on top of that. Once you've confirmed that the conditions are met, you are now ready to move to step three, which is going to be really the mathematical step of the whole test. So this is called the test statistic. 
This will be the step where we actually perform the sort of necessary statistical calculation. In other words, as we start to learn different hypothesis tests, the test statistic is the step where we actually have a formula and we have to plug values in and compute something. This calculation behind the scenes is always based on the sampling distribution, which is a concept you guys are more comfortable with now after the last set of videos. And it will measure how different our sample of data was from what we expected based on the null hypothesis. So keep in mind that little phrasing there based on the null hypothesis throughout the entire hypothesis test until we come to our conclusion, we're operating under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So what this test statistic is doing is it's saying, okay, if the test statistic is true, then let's use an appropriate sampling distribution and measure how different our data, what we actually observe, is from what we assumed or expected. In general, the larger the magnitude of the test statistic, so the more large as a positive number or the more large as a negative number the test statistic is, the more extreme our example is, in other words, the further it is from what we expected, and the stronger evidence for the alternate hypothesis it provides. In other words, the reason that large test statistics is associated with stronger evidence is because we're observing something that's much different than what we expected. If it's much different than what we expected, then that probably means our original assumption is not correct. Okay, after step three, where you calculate the test statistic, we translate that into a probability. And that's called step four, which is the p-value. So this is step four here. Step four is a p-value. The p-value is a probability, so every time we calculate a p-value, it's always going to be a number between 0 and 1, because it is a probability, and it is calculated based on the test statistic. As we learn different hypothesis tests, we will learn to use different statistical tables based on the appropriate distribution. Sometimes it'll be the normal distribution, sometimes it'll be new ones that we'll learn about, but we'll use the test statistic and a statistical table to calculate this p-value. The p-value formally, if you want a definition of it, measures the probability that we would get results as or more extreme than our sample, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So notice again in that definition, it has that phrase, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Because as we do all these computations, we're working under the assumption the null hypothesis is true. Generally speaking, we're going to have these two sort of flows of logic. Large test statistics, which we know means that our data is very different than what we expected, will correspond to small p-values, something that is very different than what we expected shouldn't happen very frequently. In other words, it'll be a small p-value, and that'll be strong evidence against that null hypothesis and for our alternate hypothesis. Small test statistics, on the other hand, means that our data is pretty similar to what we expected. Things that are pretty similar to what we expected will have large p-values because they'll happen pretty frequently. And that means they'll provide basically weak or no evidence for the alternate hypothesis or against the null hypothesis. So that'll be step four where we translate that test statistic into a probability. All right, step five, which is the last step is our conclusion. This is where we actually take all the other pieces and actually decide what this test is telling us. So every hypothesis test that we will do will end with one of two conclusions. So every time you run a hypothesis test, there's only one of two conclusions. Those two conclusions are that you can either reject HO or you can fail to reject HO. So these are the only two conclusions we will ever make when running a hypothesis test. So what do these things mean? Well, rejecting HO basically means that we found significant evidence. So notice you should sort of associate successfully rejecting HO is successfully finding significant evidence. That's significant evidence to throw out our original assumption, meaning the null hypothesis, that's why we call it rejecting HO, and we are convinced about our alternate hypothesis or our claim. So in some ways, you guys can view this as the positive outcome. We've successfully rejected the null, which means that we've successfully found evidence. That means we can successfully throw out that null, and we can successfully believe or convince ourselves about our alternate or claim. Failing to reject HO is sort of the opposite of that. 
failing to reject HO will mean that we failed to find significant evidence to throw out our original assumption and that we do not have enough evidence for our alternate hypothesis slash claim. You can sort of view that as a negative conclusion. It's where we say, well, we gathered all this data, but it doesn't really do anything for us. It's not enough to throw out our original assumption and it's not enough to support our alternate hypothesis or claim. Now, I do want to make a note here, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we do our sort of example, helping you guys understand this. We will never end by supporting HO. You notice that the phrasings of these two things are always in terms of rejecting HO. We either successfully throw it out or we fail to throw it out. Now, a lot of times people see this one and they say, oh, Failing to throw it out, isn't that the same as supporting the null? Well, no, it's not. It just means we don't have evidence to throw it out. That doesn't mean that we supported it. It just means we don't think we should get rid of it. We just haven't seen any evidence against it. That doesn't mean we supported it. The reason that we will never end by supporting the null hypothesis is actually a logical reason. If you remember, we are working the entire time under the assumption that the null is true. When you work logically under the assumption something is true, you can't end by supporting it. If you just think about it, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. That would be saying, I assume something is true, do some work, and then say, so it's true. That just seems like a complete circular logic because you started by assuming it's true. When you assume something is true, you either end up saying, oh, you know, that assumption at the beginning was wrong, that's rejecting HO, or you end up saying, you know what, that assumption isn't wrong, but I can't really say it was right either. I just didn't get anywhere. So just keep in mind, we will never end by supporting the null. Finally, something that isn't so important right now, but we'll see that when we start getting into computational examples, we'll be using it. The way we will choose our conclusion between these two is by comparing that p-value, what we calculate in step four, against what is called a level of significance, which is denoted alpha. And they will make this comparison We'll compare that p-value against that level of significance, and that'll make us decide between rejecting and failing to reject. I'm not going to say too much more about that right now because it is easier once we actually have some values to discuss them. So we'll see that in later videos. Okay, now that we've talked about these five steps, we've got to talk about something else that's sort of a natural consequence of hypothesis testing. Whenever we do a hypothesis test, there are only two possible conclusions. Unfortunately, no matter what we do in terms of how the computations are done or how much data we collect, you have to remember hypothesis tests are based on samples of data. And samples of data are limited sets of information. So whenever we carry out a hypothesis test, we always run the risk of having an error. So let's talk about what are called statistical errors. So statistical errors. Every hypothesis test is based on a sample which means it is based on limited information. This means there is always the possibility for an error. Now, an error doesn't mean that when you're doing the problem, you make a computational mistake, you type something wrong into your calculator, you miswrite something down. Doesn't mean that sort of error. It means an error where we correctly carry out the test, make the correct conclusion, but because of the data we had, that conclusion is actually the wrong conclusion in terms of what's true in real life or in reality. So, since there are two possible conclusions, there are two possible types of error, one for each type of conclusion we can make. So, a type one error. A type one error is when we make the conclusion to reject HO, but in reality, HO is true. So in other words, this is where we decide to throw out that original assumption, but that original assumption was really true. In other words, a type one error is when we throw out our original baseline assumption, but in reality, it was correct. In the medical field, this is often called a false positive, since this happens when we think we have evidence for our claim, the alternate, but in reality, we do not. You can imagine that that false positive, how that works in medicine, a lot of times if you're tested for like a disease or something like that, the original or baseline assumption is that you don't have that disease because usually most of these diseases are pretty rare. So the original baseline assumption, the null hypothesis, is that you don't have whatever that disease is. 
if somebody tells you, hey, uh, we're going to throw out that original assumption that you don't have the disease and, and you do have that disease, and they're wrong about that, that's a false positive. They're telling you incorrectly that you have something that you really don't. And that's why we often call this a false positive. Okay, a type 2 error is, when, is the type of error that we risk when we fail to reject HO. So a type 2 error is when we make the decision to fail to reject HO, but in reality, that HO is false. In other words, we fail to get rid of something that actually is incorrect. So, in other words, a type 2 error is when we do not throw out our original or baseline assumption, but in reality, it was incorrect. This is often called a missed effect, since this happens when we think that there is not evidence for our claim, but in reality, we do have evidence. So that's why we call it a missed effect, because a type 2 error happens when we look at our sample, we say to ourselves, ah, oh, that sample doesn't really seem to give us any evidence, but it did give us evidence, and we missed it. So we often call that a missed effect. Now, as we go further on, we'll talk a lot about these types of errors. And again, even though these seem pretty complex and it'll take some getting used to, you got to keep in mind there's only two possibilities for the types of errors. So while these are somewhat complicated, as we do this more and more, you'll start to see the pattern in what these different types of errors mean emerge. Okay. At this point, we've introduced a pretty complicated new topic, this idea of hypothesis testing, and we've even talked about how it can potentially go awry with these statistical errors. In the next set of videos, we're going to be doing lots of computational examples, learning how to do specific types of hypothesis testing with specific types of statistical data. But before we do that, I'd like to give you guys sort of a real-world example of hypothesis testing to help you understand what these sort of parts look like. And I think that this real world example, while it's not a statistical example, is something that people are more used to, so they can sort of clutch onto some pieces and understand what these five steps, these conclusions, and these errors really mean. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So a real life example, or if you prefer, it's a sort of a real life metaphor for hypothesis testing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the US court system. So in other words, we're gonna talk about how a trial or a US, uh, if you're ever involved in like a court case in the US, how that actually functions as a hypothesis test. Now it's not a statistical hypothesis test because there isn't like a sample of data per se, but it's sort of similar in the sense that there is a discussion of evidence and things like that. So we're gonna use this to sort of help us understand these pieces. Okay, so let's start by talking about step one, okay? So step one, as we talked about, is where you build your hypotheses. So when we talk about a US trial or a court case or something like that, let's think about what that null and alternate looks like. So when you walk in, if you're ever involved in a trial or something, and maybe you're on trial for com possibly committing a crime or something, or maybe you're sitting on a jury and you're watching somebody else possibly be, a, you know, be accused of a crime or something, there is a null or baseline assumption that every person walks in with. When they walk into that courtroom, right, the sort of standard statement you hear is innocent until proven guilty. So when they walk into that courtroom, they are under the assumption that they are innocent. That's the null hypothesis because a person who walks in before you hear anything, they're assumed to be innocent. Then the claim against them, the alternate, is that they are guilty. And that means, right, that the burden of proof is on the prosecution, right? If you're ever involved in a trial and you're sitting there in the jury, say, and they bring somebody forward and they say, this person committed a crime, and then they say, we don't have any evidence. Well, then the trial's done. Because it doesn't matter, right, that they say that they committed a crime. That person is innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof is to show that they're guilty. They have to give you evidence to have you change your mind from your assumption that they're innocent to guilty. So in court cases, the baseline assumption is that somebody is innocent and the claim against them is that they are guilty. So that's how we would think about the sort of step one, the building of the hypotheses. Now, you might be wondering why I keep saying U.S. court system. Well, this system here is different in other countries. There are places where the baseline assumption of somebody when they're accused of a crime is that they are guilty. 
And it is up to that person to provide evidence about why they didn't commit that crime. That's a completely different court system. But in the U.S., we have the policy that you are innocent until proven guilty. So we start with the assumption that you're innocent, and then we determine, is there enough evidence to say that somebody is guilty? Okay, let's go ahead and talk about step two. So step two are the conditions. Now, obviously, in a trial, these conditions aren't statistical, but there still are condition. conditions. These are what we would sort of call the rules of a trial. So there's rules about evidence, testimony, witnesses, discovery, etc. Right. So even if you don't you haven't really thought a lot about like court systems or trials or things like that, we all know that when there's a trial, there's rules about how evidence has to be collected and handled. There's rules about what sort of testimony is allowed. There's rules about what sort of witnesses are allowed to bring forward. There's ways in how you can question witnesses and there's ways that you're not allowed to question witnesses. There's a concept called discovery where both sides of a case have to give ample time to the other side to prepare for witnesses or evidence they might bring. So there's a tremendous amount of sort of rules that apply to a trial. So what happens if those rules aren't followed? Well, if those rules aren't followed, right? If these aren't followed, well, what happens is it becomes a mistrial. A mistrial doesn't mean that the person's innocent, doesn't mean that the person's guilty. It means that you have to redo the entire trial because what they're basically saying is if these things are not followed, then the results of the trial aren't valid because those conditions weren't met. And that's the same thing that applies in statistics. If you don't follow the sort of rules of statistics or the rules of collecting good data, then it doesn't matter what your results are. You have to redo everything. And by redoing everything, that doesn't mean redoing your calculations. That means redoing the collection of evidence, everything all over again. So this we can think about in the concept of a mistrial. Okay. So maybe the weakest part of this uh, metaphor is, of course, step three, which is the test statistic. As we know, in a court case, there is no such thing as a test statistic. Um, there's no computation that's going on. Nobody's computing something during a trial. But this really is the trial. Right? The test statistic in statistics is where we calculate everything based on our data. In real life, in a, in a court case, it's the actual trial. This is where all the evidence is presented, the witnesses are questioned, you, the jury gets to hear all the testimony and pieces of information. This really is the sort of trial. And the idea in here is that this sort of trial tells us, okay, based on the information we're hearing and the assumption that this person is innocent, how extreme are these results, right? If we hear all this evidence, is this evidence really extreme under the assumption that somebody's innocent? Or is it so extreme that we can't really believe that they're innocent and we have to go with the claim that they're guilty? So the actual computation in a court case really takes place during the actual trial. Okay, step four, the p-value. Again, we know that in real life, nobody's calculating a probability here, but the p-value really can be thought about as sort of the deliberation part, right? This is where the jury sort of thinks about the evidence that they were presented. And they sort of think about it, remember, in this sense. We sort of said that if a p-value is low, this implies strong evidence against HO, and for HA. And the p-value is high implies weak evidence against HO and for HA. So I want to give you guys just sort of a little thought experiment specifically about this step. So let's actually take this idea that you're on a trial and you're in the part of deliberation. So maybe the trial that you're on is about somebody who's been accused of robbing a gas station. So maybe the first piece of evidence that was presented in the trial is that there are witnesses that state that the person who robbed this gas station was male. Okay. So if that was the only piece of information that was provided, right, let's think about this assumption, right? You have this person who's standing in front of you. You're assuming that they're innocent, 
you can see that they're male and you're saying, okay, what's sort of the probability that this person happens to be male but is still innocent? Well, obviously it's very high, right? Just because this person's male and the person who robbed the gas station is male doesn't automatically make us switch from innocent to guilty. Okay, so maybe the prosecutors provide you with another piece of information. Not only do witnesses say that the person was male, but they also said that the person was male and wearing a red hoodie. Okay, so maybe then they also tell you that the person that they're accusing of the crime was picked up as a male and wearing a red hoodie. Okay. Now that might be a little bit lower of a probability. You might say, okay, there's not quite so many people out there wearing red hoodies as there are people who are just males, but still most of us would probably not switch from innocent to guilty. Okay, they might say, well, we actually have a little bit more information. Not only do we have like confirmation that the person who robbed the gas station was male and wearing a red hoodie, we also have confirmation that they have the name Bob tattooed across their forehead. And as you can see, the guy we're accusing of the crime well, not only is he male and was picked up wearing a red hoodie, he has the name Bob tattooed across his forehead. Okay, now at this point, you could say, well, maybe I'm still gonna go with the assumption he's innocent. Maybe we just happen to pick up a guy who's male, wearing a red hoodie, and has Bob tattooed across his forehead. But a lot of us would start to think that the probability is very low that we just happen to pick up another male wearing a red hoodie with Bob tattooed across his forehead. So we would begin to shift from this original assumption of innocent to this belief of guilty. So as the evidence stacks up and things get more and more extreme, the probability that all of this is coincidence or happening by chance is lower and lower. Is there a chance that this is just some random guy who is wearing a red hoodie and has Bob tattooed on his forehead and it's nothing to do with this robbery? Sure, but the chance that that's happening just by sheer randomness is getting lower and lower. So as it gets lower and lower, the evidence gets stronger and stronger. So that's the main thing I want you guys to take away from step four. All right, the last piece of this, step five, and this is the one we really wanna talk about, the conclusion. So remember we said that there's only two possible conclusions. You can reject HO or you can fail to reject HO. So let's think about what those would mean in this context. Rejecting HO means that you're throwing out your null and going with your claim. Let's think about what that would mean in this case. In this case, you're saying you're throwing out your null and going with this. So. This would be where we would say we have significant evidence against HO and for HA. And the verdict we would give would be we would say guilty. Because what have we done? We've said, okay, we're gonna reject the baseline assumption that they're innocent and we're gonna go with the claim. We've seen enough evidence. The probability is so low that this happened just by random chance that we are willing to throw out that they are innocent and go with the statement that they are guilty. So the verdict we would pronounce here is guilty. All right, failing to reject HO. This would mean we have no significant evidence against HO and for HA. Now, we gotta be really careful here. What is the verdict? So, when you're saying we don't have any reason to throw this guy out, but that doesn't mean we've supported this, right? We didn't say that we feel that the person is innocent. We're just saying we don't see any reason to shift to guilty. So the verdict that would be pronounced here is not guilty. And this is the whole reason that I really wanted to focus on this part right here. Because failing to reject HO, like I said when we were first having this discussion, isn't saying that we support the null. It's just saying we don't see any reason to move away from it. So in a court case, failing to reject HO doesn't mean that we think the person's innocent. We're just saying we don't think that they're guilty. In other words, if you imagine that in that sort of court case, right, that we were talking about the gas station robbery, and we've got this guy who, you know, all the only evidence against him is he's in a red hoodie. When we say, okay, you know, we're going to say not guilty, we're not saying that we think he's innocent. We're just saying you haven't really given us any reason to change our mind. 
So we would pronounce them not guilty. Okay, so this right here sort of shows you guys the five steps of a hypothesis test applied to something that maybe we have a little bit more understanding of. Now, let's wrap this up by talking about the errors. So let's add sort of one more page here and talk about the errors. So errors in the court case. So let's talk about the type one error. So remember, a type one error, this is where we reject HO, but HO is true. So let's think of what that would mean in the court case. So we're saying we would reject HO. Well, we just talked about how rejecting HO matches to giving a verdict of guilty. So this is where we would decide that they're guilty, but HO is true. Well, HO, remember, is that they are innocent. So what is a type one error here? This is where we decide someone is guilty, that's our decision, but in reality, they are innocent. So as you can imagine, this is definitely an error. This is where we decide that they're guilty, but in reality, they are innocent. And of course, in court cases, this happens some of the time, right? And this is definitely a concern, right? This is where we think that there's enough evidence to change our mind from innocent to guilty, but in reality, they are innocent. In other words, in my really sort of ridiculous example, this really does mean that the guy we picked up who was wearing that red hoodie and had Bob tattooed across his forehead, well, he just happened to be an innocent bystander, but we decided he was guilty. And that is a possibility when we're in a sort of limited information situation. Okay, what about type two? So a type two error, this is where we fail to reject HO, but HO is false. So this is where we decide to fail to reject HO, but HO is false. That's the definition of type two. Now, failing to reject HO, we talked about that as a conclusion. That means that we decide not guilty, but HO is false. So that means hey, they are not really innocent, they are guilty. So this, is where we decide someone is not guilty, but in reality, they are guilty. And you can sort of see how this one would be called a missed effect, right? They really did commit whatever crime we're accusing them of, but we missed it and gave them this sort of verdict of not guilty. So both of these are possible errors, right? They're both possible statistical errors, and of course they're both real life potential errors whenever there's a court case or trial. Now, both of these errors, I think we would all agree, are bad things, right? I don't think we want people who are innocent being stated that they're guilty, and we don't want people who are guilty going free and getting a verdict of not guilty. The downside, it's something we'll explore a lot later on, is that unfortunately, you can't avoid both of these. What I mean by that is, imagine you decide that this one is really bad. Like you never, you say to yourself, I'm never gonna take an innocent person and say that they're guilty. Well, if you say that, you say, I'm never going to take an innocent person and call them guilty. Then what's gonna happen is that you're naturally gonna make this error a lot because you wanna be absolutely certain before you shift from innocent to guilty. That means that some cases where somebody is guilty but there's not a ton of evidence about them, you're gonna let them go. So you're gonna, if by avoiding this error, you make this error a lot more. It works vice versa. If you say to yourself, I'm never gonna let a guilty person go free. Well, you can do that by basically, as soon as you see any evidence, just jump in the gun and saying, I immediately think that they're guilty but then you're gonna have this error happen a lot more to you. So one of the things that's a challenge in statistics is that these errors, or at least some sort of error, is basically unavoidable. We always have the risk. Now, does this mean that every court case or every statistical uh, hypothesis test ends in an error? No, of course not, right? If that was the case, we wouldn't do that. 
but they always have the risk of this. And understanding that risk is something we'll investigate a lot in later examples. So this sort of wraps up your guys' introduction to hypothesis testing. In our next video, we'll actually lay out the computations necessary for the first statistical hypothesis test, and then we'll start getting into some examples.